For the past half century, the United States of America has dominated a category no one would ever want to own. We have, as a nation, one of the most radical abortion regimes in the world. It might surprise you to know this. You certainly won't hear it from anyone on any other network. But that supposedly extreme Mississippi law headed for the Supreme Court, which would block most abortions after 15 weeks, would be right at home in Europe when all those nations the left wants to emulate in other areas of policy, like France and Sweden, ban abortion. In fact, all the countries you see on your screen ban elective abortion at 12 weeks. None of them have what America effectively has in many states, abortion up to the point of birth. For that, you have to look at our moral equals in nations like China or North Korea. Why is it that America has persisted in this extreme regime even as the rest of the world woke up to the moral reality of what abortion does to families and societies. It's a complicated story, but it's also very simple, really. Many of us have been willing to look the other way, and a vast industry of powerful forces in our country have worked very hard to make sure that we do. Understand, there is no more important single issue today to the left than the issue of abortion. It is an item of faith they are wedded to stronger than any religious conviction. If you've ever been taken aback by the vitriol, violence, and false accusations leveled against any who challenge abortion, you'll know what I'm talking about, the kind that makes a young woman spit on an elderly priest. It's safer to attempt sacrilege in a cathedral than abortion rallies. To criticize the abortion regime is to place yourself at odds not just with the most powerful activist groups and donors. It is to take on the woke corporatists and Hollywood and our corrupt media and big tech and well, just about everybody with power in America today. Since the moment Roe versus Wade short-circuited the legal conversation about abortion, the pro-abortion left has worked to gaslight the country into believing things that just aren't true. They pretended they wanted abortions to be rare. They claimed they didn't profit from them. They denied they sold organs. They refused to acknowledge the science of what we know about the development of unborn babies, utterly unknown to the authors of Roe, by the way. And they ignored the terrible and tragic impact on America's poorest and most vulnerable families, and on the black community in particular. More black babies are aborted than born in New York City every year, and that's fine with them. They also did everything they could to build up men like Bill Clinton and Andrew Cuomo, because the abortion agenda is always more important. Why do you think Joe Biden flipped on the Hyde Amendment and taxpayer-funded abortions after an entire career of saying he believed the opposite? Every Sunday, his head bowed in his church. He knows who runs the left. He wanted to be president, and he was willing to make a deal to do it. And in every aspect of this effort, the pro-abortion left has had the strong advocacy of a media that has displayed more corruption on this topic than perhaps any other. If you watch ABC, NBC, or CBS today, pro-life women simply do not exist. The media's coverage of this issue is indistinguishable from Planned Parenthood press releases, and the journalists who cover it are universally not just pro-choice, but obviously pro-abortion. But now, at long last, something is happening. The energy in the pro-life movement is like nothing we've seen before. Abortion is no longer accepted as an unobjectionable good. The Shout Your Abortion movement, where women are encouraged by the abortion lobby to boast about killing their children, comes across as desperate and sad. Decades of ultrasound pictures on refrigerators and women brave enough to talk about miscarriage and loss have a way of changing minds. When Iceland says they've eradicated Down syndrome, good people cringe because we know what that really means. I am a man. See me as a human being, not a birth defect, not a syndrome. I don't need to be eradicated. I don't need to be Cured. And when naive leftists regularly suggest that pro-lifers like children so much, maybe we should force the dads to pay child support for unborn babies, our response is, your terms are acceptable. There is today renewed hope among those who believe every unborn baby has a right to life, that the Supreme Court may at long last reopen this significant question for us to decide as citizens and states, instead of leaving the deepest moral question of life and death to nine people in robes. Tonight I'm going to be talking to a number of heroic pro-life women who brought us to this moment. Their determined work in law and politics and culture is absolutely the reason we are at this point, so many of us despaired and once thought impossible. They've taken on the Goliath of the abortion industry and all its vile works with fearless dedication to be a voice for the voiceless. Much of the discussion around abortion is about the law. 
And of course, we'll talk about that tonight. But there's another law I want you to consider as you listen, and that is the law written on your hearts. Back in 1933, long before Roe, Whitaker Chambers was working as a Soviet agent when his wife found out she was pregnant. Despite the initial joy, they both knew that as communist agents, such things were not possible. His wife went to see a doctor to make arrangements. When she came back, she was quiet and noncommittal. But it slowly dawned on Chambers she wanted to keep the child. He asked her. As he writes in his autobiography, Witness, my wife came over to me, took my hands, and burst into tears. Dear heart, she said in a pleading voice, we couldn't do that awful thing to a little baby. Not to a little baby, dear heart. A wild joy swept me. Reason, the agony of my family, the Communist Party and its theories, the wars and revolutions of the 20th century crumbled at the touch of the child. What we are discussing tonight is the most fundamental question for us, whether the unborn lives that take root here in America are unique persons with the right to draw breath and blossom, or whether they are non-persons, lives unworthy of life, human weeds, as Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger called them, whose destruction is a public good. The Mishnah tells us that to destroy a life is, destroy, is to destroy a whole world, the worlds that would have been with that life in it. Look to the law written on your heart. You know this to be true. I'm Ben Tomich, and this is the American Crisis. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.